Well, as you guys know, I'm Andrea Hernandez Vega. Um, this summer I had the honor of doing research at Hunter College, especially at CHES, which is the Center for HIV and Educational Studies and Training, where I studied the association of methamphetamine use and poor cognitive flexibility in a sample of gay and bisexual men. How do I? It doesn't change. Okay, here we go. First little background on meth. Meth is one of the most addictive psychostimulants <coughs> out there and it is particularly dangerous because it is so easy to synthesize and that makes it very accessible. Uh, in 2013, they did a survey that indicated that 595,000 Americans had used meth in the past month, so it is a very dangerous drug. Meth use can lead to neurocognitive deficits, specifically within executive functions, the inhibition of irrelevant information, episodic memory, which just means that you have a hard time remembering details, information processing speed, you're just a little slower, motor skills, language, and visual constructional abilities, which is just how we manipulate spatial information. This is very important to study since crystal meth use can have these deficits. They can impair decision making abilities and within this sample since they are meth using, that can affect the quality of their lives. Our hypothesis was that the amount of crystal meth use and the severity of the dependence will be associated with less cognitive flexibility at a neurocognitive decisional making task. Our methods. All the data that we used in this project was actually from a way larger study called ACE, which stands for Adherence Counseling and Education. Since it is such a big study, I am just here acknowledging all the lovely people that were involved in making it. A little bit more about ACE. ACE consisted of 210 HIV positive gay and bisexual guys. Um, they were verified to have HIV, they had trouble adhering to their antiretroviral medication, and those were at least three out of 30 days that they had these problems, and at least three days of meth use within the past 90 days. It has many components, but we're going to be focusing on what are timeline follow-back interviews, ACASI measures, and the neurocognitive testing. Timeline follow-back interviews is just that we, we would sit down with the participants and ask them about their behavior, and that's where actually we got one of the predictors, which was, which was the number of meth use days. ACASI measures are audio computer assisted self-interviews, which is just a fancy word of saying they interviewed themselves on computers. <laughs> Um, although the sample is 210 guys, we'll be focusing on the 168 that actually went through neurocognitive testing. A little bit more about the sample, it was a racially diverse sample. Um, like shown in literature with meth users, most of them led, had, less, had less than a bachelor's degree and they were unemployed, for the most part they were single. Uh, the average age was 40, but they ranged from 24 years of age to 63. Now what we were really looking at was cognitive flexibility, which is just the ability for you to restructure your knowledge to the ever-changing demands of the environment. And we put this in operation as the Wisconsin Card Sorting Task Errors T-score. T-score just means that it's being controlled for age and education. They're being compared with people their similar age and their same educational background. And you may think, oh, more, more errors, higher score, bad. But since it's being controlled, higher score in this case is good. The Wisconsin card sort test looks something like this. And it just measures set shifting, which is the ability to attend to a particular stimulus, just dimension, just like color or shape. The participants were shown cards and they would have to sort them and they were not told what to sort them based on. They could either like try to find a pattern if it was by color or shape but randomly the test would change. Maybe they would get the pattern and start with color and then out of nowhere it would start saying no that was a mistake, that was a mistake and it measured that ability to like restructure the fact that oh it's no longer about color, now it's about shape, let me change that. So it, it has to do with compete, the competing stimuli that they're receiving. So the predictors that we used in this study 
was the Composite International Diagnostic Interview. We'll just call it City Sam. That's just an <coughs> interview to assess whether you have dependence to meth and the severity of meth dependence and number of meth use days. Severity of meth dependence and um, assessing dependence may sound very similar, but the City Sam asks questions more like, how, like, how often have you used meth in the past month? Versus severity was more like, at the prospect of not being able to get your fix, how in, how did you feel? How much did it worry you from zero to three? Like, it doesn't bother me to, it was impossible for me to deal with. So even though they're kind of similar, they're different. Our data analysis. We did a linear regression in SPSS where the dependent variable were the T-scores and the predictors were years living with HIV, education, race, number of meth use days, the city SAM, and the severity of meth dependence. Um, as you guys can see, the ones that are not underlined weren't things that I had mentioned before, but they are things that can affect the statistical significance because they do have issues with cognitive problems. So we included it on the, on the model. So you guys are going to see here a lot of numbers, but let's focus right here. You know that a p-score that is less than 0.05 is a significant one, and out of our model with our predictors, the only significant one with a, a p-value of, of 0.04 was the severity of meth dependence, and it was a negative association. What all that really means is the severity of meth dependence holds a negative association with the performance on the Wisconsin card sort. As the severity of the meth dependence increased, their scores overall decreased. What this can mean is that severe meth use can cause repetitive maladaptive behaviors and keeping studies like these in mind can tailor interventions so important just like rehabilitation, making art regimens more simple so they adapt to their reality with their cognitive capacities. Like all studies, it has its limitations. It's only one neurocognitive task, and as you guys remember from one of the first slides, it's a very long list of things that meth can do. It targets a very specific population, so it's not as generalizable, and the measures were self-reported, so there's some room for error. So none of this would have been possible without all the help from and grants that the SPUR program receives. And CHEST... I know the people at CHEST and my institution back home, of course, and the participants that volunteered their time. So, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? No? <laughs> well, thank you.